Okay, so let's, con let's continue. What, um, j just to remind you where we left off last time, I'd been talking about uh, the, the motion of a spin in a magnetic field and um, the uh, transitions induced by a rotating field, uh, the so-called Rabi resonance formula. Let me just go back to it for a second. Recall that um, we're interested in a case in the laboratory. We have a static field like this. We have a rotating field like this. And if we go into a rotating frame going along uh, with this uh, field over here, then the effect is to reduce the static field by an amount um, omega over gamma where the, uh, the magnetic moment of this particle we've written as the gyromagnetic ratio times the angular momentum gamma times h bar times i. Yeah. And so the system then evolves around this static field in this rotating system. So if the magnetic moment initially is pointing in this direction over here, here we have mu at t equals zero, then later on it goes around like that. And I left it as a construction to show that the z component of this at some time later t was given by one minus twice omega, well I've used uh, both large and small r's here, omega r squared over omega, you want small? It's r plus omega minus omega naught squared times uh, the sine squared of one half omega r squared plus omega minus omega naught squared. This is in your notes. It'll be in the notes that I've given out, so there's no need to copy. But um, I would like to interpret this slightly differently. If we have a spin one-half system, then the z component of mu can be written as gamma times <coughs> h bar times the z component of i, which will be m, m sub i, where m sub i is equal to plus or minus one-half. And the expectation value of mu z then um, is just going to be equal to one half gamma h bar times the probability that it's in the state uh, p one half minus the probability that it's in the state of p minus one half, p one half, and p minus one half. So these are the probabilities, and of course, the sum of the probabilities, p one half plus p minus one half is equal to one. So I can write this just as well as um, one half gamma times h bar times one minus twice the probability of being in the minus one half state. So we see that the probability of being in the minus one-half state after time t over here, just by comparing this formula over here with, uh, with um, this formula here, particularly if I put in the magnetic moment in front of it, which is gamma times h bar. <coughs> the probability of being in the minus one-half state is given by this formula over here. The probability, maybe a better way of putting it, it the probability that it starts, it's, it's gone from one half to the minus one half, because it started in the plus one half. So this is, this is what we call a probability of a transition. The transition one half to minus one half is given by, again, th this now familiar formula, which is omega Rabi squared over omega Rabi squared plus 
omega minus omega naught squared times this sine squared of one half omega rabi squared plus omega minus omega naught squared times t. Um, let's look at what happens when the system starts out. Okay. Small t. What does small t mean? Well, it means that the argument of this thing over here is going to be rather small. It means you can replace the sign of the thing with its, um, uh, you know, with its value. In that case, the probability of minus one half is approximately equal to one quarter omega rabi squared times t squared. Okay. Well, <coughs> let's look at the, uh, the, the rate of transition if we want. The rate of, of, of the transition is the rate of change of its being in, in, in this new state. So the transition rate I'll put this in quotation marks, which is dp by dt, is going to be equal to one half omega rabi squared t. And the question is, why should the system behave like that? One knows that if you have a system and you apply radiation, it starts making transitions. If I look at the, the population, say, of the plus one-half state as a function of time, according to this, this is, uh, here we have the n uh, in, the, in the plus state as a function of time. Say it starts off at n naught over here. What, we, what we're going to see over here is that it is, you know, it is oscillating back and forth like that. Whereas normally, you'd expect that uh, dn by dt is equal to minus some rate times n. This is a normal decay curve. You'd expect it to behave like this. So it not only starts out entirely differently, it's moving down quadratically. This rate over here, <coughs> this is a constant. Of course, this is not a constant rate there. It's oscillating, which is an unnatural way to behave. It does do this. You can actually, I showed, I think, a quick picture of Rabi oscillations under the right conditions that uh, these are, are quite manifest. And um, so there's nothing wrong with the Rabi formula, but there is something wrong with how we're trying to apply it over here. Um, the Rabi resonance was designed for this very first situation of resonance where you have an atomic beam coming along. You can select the spin state okay, with a magnet. Okay. And then it goes through, you do this with inhomogeneous fields, it goes through then a homogeneous field w where it starts precessing, and then you do this trick. You apply the rotating field and you can turn it over, and then it goes through another magnet and you can see which field it was in. So you really are uh, approaching this ideal situation very well, where <coughs> the atom just sees a pure rotating field for a little while. Um, that is totally different from the usual situation in radiation. In fact, the usual situ situation in radiation is where you are radiating the system with um, very broadband radiation, with maybe thermal radiation. Lasers, well, the laser can be very narrow. It can also be rather broad. So this is very handy to know about for manipulating atoms. But I'd like to address the more general question right now of atoms and radiation fields. And that's what I'll be talking about today. Now, a, a lot of this gets into details. And I realize I don't want to bore you too much with details. They are in the notes that will be handled out. So I, I'm going to skip some of the details, but I would like to outline it. 
But what I'd like to do is to start with talking about the granddaddy radiation problem, which was the problem of black body radiation. Famous problem, it started really quantum theory. And uh, the problem was to find the spectrum of radiation in a warm cavity or any cavity. They didn't use the terms cavity in those days. They didn't have cavities, but uh, you had a, a black body. You had an oven with a hole in it, and you looked at the radiation which came out. And of course, it was in trying to fit that radiation that observed spectrum to, to theory that Planck came out <coughs> with his quantum hypothesis uh, in 1900. You know, we had this famous problem. It's an interesting history. The ultraviolet catastrophe, if you calculate the density of modes in space, they're infinite. And if you're going to apply the equipartition theorem, you immediately get infinite energy. This is called the ultraviolet catastrophe. Um, and uh, <coughs> it's generally considered this is what motivated, really, the, uh, the start of quantum mechanics or quantum physics. Um, it's always interesting when you go back and really look at the history of these things. <coughs> Planck postulated his, um, his radiation formula in 1900. The term ultraviolet catastrophe got first used in 1905 when Rayleigh was considering the problem again and pointed out the ultraviolet catastrophe. He knew about Planck's formula and said, Professor Planck has a marvelous, uh, ha has a formula which gives exquisite agreement with the theory, but I can't possibly understand it. And Planck couldn't either that uh, Planck uh, put forward this mathematical way, namely quantizing the energies of harmonic oscillators, and uh, pointed out that if you do this, you get the right answer. But he didn't really believe it. It was Einstein who started it all in 1905 on his paper on the photoelectric effect, which is a marvelous paper <coughs> if one looks at it. Um, he really took the, the idea of uh, of discrete, the discrete nature of radiation as a starting point. His paper starts out by saying that um, although we know that the wave theory of light works extremely well, it's interesting to note that it has only been observed in essentially macroscopic phenomena. We have no microscopic theory of the transition uh, of the uh, transition of energy from the radiation field to, to matter. And so th that we, we may maintain the wave theory of light, but there may be much more to it than that. And then goes on and postulates the existence of energy quanta, not at all related. He makes no reference at all, really, to Planck's uh, way of doing things, which is purely artificial. It was based on looking at the entropy of the radiation field. So it was a marvelous paper, and it has a very interesting title. It's called On a Heuristic Theory of the interaction of radiation with matter. Heuristic meant that he didn't, it's something you put forward which is so wild that uh, you don't really believe it, but it's useful for motivating uh, discussion. And uh, he, he never, th there's an element of doubt in that paper which he never lost. Uh, it eventually divorced him from quantum mechanics, but it was there from the very beginning. But what I would like to do is to talk about not that paper, but the famous paper on the absorption and radiation of light by matter, the uh, 1917 paper on um, radiation theory, which, um, <coughs> well, do you, uh, do you know about the Einstein A and B coefficients? Have many of you heard about this? Have many of you heard about it but are afraid to put your hands up? Okay, yeah, it, it's, it's, normally, it, it's normally taught, and it's, it's quite straightforward. But if you look at the paper itself, uh, it is much richer. And so this is sort of an historical digression, but I thought it would be interesting and worthwhile for you. So let me talk a little bit about what, what's really going on in Einstein's paper. And uh, now we have to go back and do something to this. Is it, is it coming up? Ah. 
Was that too fast for you? <laughs> ah. Um. Oh, okay, there we go. This is a 19 paper. It is available in, in translation into English, perhaps into Portuguese. Okay, <coughs> it, it's on the, uh, on the quantum theory of radiation. What Einstein was really interested in was not absorption and radiation of light. What he was interested in is thermal equilibrium. And the question that he wanted to ask is, how do atoms come into thermal equilibrium with a radiation field? It, the Planck radiation formula was well known and well established then. But the question is, suppose you have a gas of atoms just moving around in free space uh, and the only thing they interact with is radiation. How does the system come into thermal equilibrium? And he looked at this system rather completely. He wanted to know how atoms come into thermal equilibrium um, with respect to the internal states. Remember, I talked uh, in my first lecture about how we have achieved uh, complete control over atoms. We can control their internal states completely, and we can now control their external, their translational states completely. Einstein was interested in that problem from the very beginning. He understood th the, the nature of both of these forms of uh, energy in the atoms and that th they interact with radiation rather differently. And he wanted to know how both of those systems became into, <coughs> came into thermal equilibrium. The first part, which is the part which most people know, is uh, how the uh, energy levels of an atom achieve equil equilibrium with thermal or black body radiation. But he went on to ask, how do the momentum states of the atoms come into thermal equilibrium? Namely, he took it for granted that the uh, atoms obeyed the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution law, which is based on classical statistical mechanics. Okay? Suppose you put a lot of atoms into the cavity and suppose they all have the same uh, speed to begin with. Well, eventually, they'll get into <coughs> equilibrium with the thermal radiation, and they'll obey the Maxwell-Boltzmann law. And so the question is, how do they do that? So he was interested both in energy exchange and, as it turns out, momentum exchange with the atoms. What he did was rather, well, the whole paper was rather novel, but I would not have thought of doing it this way. <coughs> what he did was to um, assume that the atoms are in thermal equilibrium and then find out what thermal field is need, needed to, to maintain the equilibrium. Okay? And what you find is that if the atoms are in thermal equilibrium, the radiation field has to be the Planck field. So he made a number of assumptions, and they're very interesting assumptions. The first one is that he, he took for granted the existence of stationary states of atoms. That idea had been postulated just a few years before by Bohr, um, but uh, he just took it for granted that's the way things are. And he considered just two levels of interest. That is the only quantum assumption that he really makes in this paper. Okay. He assumed that the level populations are governed by Boltzmann's law, that these two this distribution of these two states is given by uh, Boltzmann. <coughs> He <coughs> a rather um, unjustified assumption. If you're going to assume that the energy levels uh, obey a new mechanics, why should the, uh, a, the distribution of energies obey Boltzmann's law, which is perfectly classical? <coughs> but uh, it worked, <coughs> and he did it. And then <coughs> he assumed that atoms absorb energy and go to the, from the ground state to the excited state at some rate. It's the Einstein coefficient b times e energy density rho of mu. Rho is the energy per unit volume, per unit time, you know, assuming that it's isotropic. This, this assumption is really quite reasonable. If you look at a classical oscillator and you drive it by random fluctuating fields in all direction, you'll find that it exchanges energy with the fields 
according to the energy density uh, uh, that's present. Okay. Well, <coughs> what were the conclusions of the first part? The first is that uh, the atoms could absorb energy from the field. Um, let's see, did I leave out a paper here? Yeah, okay. The atoms emit energy at the same rate they absorb energy. If you have a, an, an oscillator in a field, depending on the instantaneous re, uh, phase of the oscillator with respect to the field, it'll either absorb energy or it'll emit energy. So the fact that the absorption and the emission processes come together is perfectly classical. Then spontaneous emission. He pointed out that this process had to exist. I don't know who talked about it before then, except <coughs> Michelson in 1885, who made studies of the width of spectral lines. These are fascinating studies. When he had his interferometer, he could measure line widths, and he made a very detailed measurements on line widths and learned all sorts of physics from it. He m learned about Doppler broadening of the lines and from that checked Maxwell's Boltzmann's law. Uh, he also learned about collisional broadening of the lines and this was, th that information was directly used by Lorentz. Um, but he pointed out that even if you don't have uh, a collisional broadening um, or you don't have uh, uh, motional broadening, that the line would still have some width to it because all oscillators decay, and if they decay, they're going to have some sort of natural line width. So th that's the first place, I think, that the idea of the natural line width, which is in the, you know, part of spontaneous emission, came up. Um, but um, Einstein simply said that you had to have this process. It's a very simple also to see why you have to have that process. Um, suppose you have a lot of excited atoms in an in empty space at absolute zero. Well, thermal equilibrium means all the atoms are in the ground state. Right? How do they get there? They have to just do it. So, a, and, uh, so he postulated that you had to have this spontaneous emission process. Um, and it was a, a real problem for him, as I will explain. Well, the conclusions of part A, um, it, it's gone through in the notes. It's really quite simple. Uh, but the important conclusions are that spontaneous emission is essential. And the absorption frequency of these atoms has to obey the Bohr frequency relation. He didn't assume the Bohr frequency relation. He, he showed that this had to follow from that. And he also showed that the stimulated emission rate is proportional to the spontaneous emission rate. So those are the major findings of the first part of this. He also showed, though, what he really set out to find out was that the radiation field had to be given by the Planck formula. He, he commented, I deduced in a remarkably simple and general manner form uh, Planck's, well, that's meant to be a formula, yeah. Um, spontaneous emission, he introduced in a very cavalier fashion. He said the atoms will radiate spontaneously at a uniform rate in analogy with the law of radioactive decay. Radioactive decay had been discovered around the turn of the century, and um, it caused a great deal of perplexity. People did not know uh, why things should decay spontaneously. It's against sort of all classical ideas that things could happen randomly like that. <clears throat> so it was an intellectual problem then. It was a real intellectual problem for Einstein, but he did not face it right here. He just uh, took it as an analogy. But he makes this comment at the end of the section, the weakness of the theory lies in the fact that it leaves moment and direction of the elementary process to chance, that is spontaneous emission. All the same, I have complete confidence in the re reliability of the method. So he's saying there's a, there's a conceptual flaw in the method. Uh, nonetheless, he thinks the method is correct. Um, now, on the analogy of spontaneous emission radioactive decay, this was found around 1900, uh, and it really caused people a lot of agonizing. There's an interesting quote by Abraham Pice, who's really the greatest historian of that period, uh, by, um, about James Jeans. Interesting but difficult questions arise when we just, this is what James Jeans uh, uh, said 50 years, not 50 years, 
20, 30 years later. Interesting but difficult questions arise when we discuss which atoms will disintegrate first and which will live longest without disintegration. Suppose that 500 million atoms are due to disintegrate in the next second. What we may inquire determines which particular atoms will fill the quota. It seemed to remove causality from the large part of our picture of the physical world. Okay. Um, well, this problem really bothered Einstein. It bothered him when he first introduced his, the, his ideas in 1905, labeling the theory heuristic meant he had deep reservations about it. And of course, his unwillingness to accept, uh, to accept a probabilistic uh, descriptions of nature eventually divorced him from quantum mechanics. So many people think this is one of the great tragedies of the 20th century, that Einstein could not reconcile himself to that. But the misgivings were there from the very beginning. Uh, nonetheless, at least in 1917, he was willing to live with them. Okay. Part B, how the external states, momentum states of a gas of atoms achieve equilibrium with thermal radiation. And this is the part most people don't look, but it's really very ingenious. Uh, the, he assumes the atoms exchange, you know, they absorb and radiate not only energy but also momentum with the thermal radiation field, you know, by stimulated and spontaneous emission. And it, these processes generate a viscous retarding force. This viscous retarding force is essentially the force of optical molasses, which is used in laser <coughs> cooling. He assumes that the atom's velocity distribution obeys the Maxwell-Boltzmann law for velocities in a gas. And what he points out that whenever an atom absorbs a photon, its momentum is changed so that the radiation, the spectrum it sees then has been altered. It's not the spectrum it saw when it was absorbing it. So absorbing and uh, 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 emitting radiation con continually changes the spectrum the atom sees. Um, <coughs> But the result of these effects is to cause a spread in the, variety, the velocities of the atoms. It, and that spread depends on the shape of the spectrum. Then he proves, though, for the velocity spread to be given by the Maxwell-Boltzmann law, the radiation field must be described by the Planck law. So what's the significance? Well, general significance is that the basic radiation processes, spontaneous and stimulated emission, were elucidated for the first time, and their fundamental relations were revealed. The fundamental, na fundamental nature of spontaneous emission was established. The Planck radiation law was redrived by totally new arguments. More importantly, the full nature of radioact uh, radiative de quanta, that is photons, was elucidated for the first time. People kind of knew about this before, but it was Einstein who really sort of ma made the photon idea really concrete in this paper. Incidentally, he did not use the term photon. He always talked about elementary excitations. He did not like the term photon. Um, but this is the paper really where the photon uh, was for all practical purposes uh, made legitimate. Um, now the, um, his arguments for the interactions of atoms with the field pointed out that the, uh, the, the, for the atoms to have their Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, the field has to be the Planck field. If one assumes that the atom distribution was essentially monochromatic, you would end up by these arguments showing that the radiation field had to be essentially monochromatic. What he's done here is lay the, the intellectual foundations for laser cooling because, in fact, with laser cooling, the velocity distribution of the atoms approaches as monochromatic as the field can be, namely the spectrum always has a width which is due to the Doppler broadening of it. So if one assumes that the, uh, th that the atoms were very, were very, uh, were initially all moving with, uh, say, at zero temperature, if you like, but that the radiation field that they interacted with was given by the natural line width of the atoms, you'd end up with a, with a Doppler limit. It's often been pointed out that this paper, in this paper, really uh, Einstein, well, he almost invented the laser, pointing out the importance of stimulated emission. Well, this paper 
almost invented um, atom cooling. Um, and as an interesting footnote to this, people didn't really, like most of his papers, many of his papers, didn't take it too seriously at the time. But the experimental verification of the uh, particle-like properties of the photon were proved decisively in 1923 by the Compton effect. Remember, in the Compton effect that you have uh, an electron which is coming in, uh, a, a quanta which comes in and scatters off an electron and gives momentum to the, uh, to the electron and goes off in a different direction. And because it is given off momentum, it's given off energy and its frequency changes. That's the Compton, Compton effect discovered in 1923. Compton got the Nobel Prize for that. Um, an interesting footnote to that paper is if you read the paper, somehow or other Compton <coughs> manages to overlook talking about Einstein altogether. Um, he, does, he just doesn't mention Einstein. Uh, he just assumes that the photon has this momentum. This is a rather new idea, and it was Einstein's idea. But uh, apparently, uh, he felt justified in sort of taking it for granted at the time. Well, OK, that's enough of this um, digression right now. So if we can have the lights on over there, I will return to the blackboard. Let me return for just a moment to this, um, to this big gap between the Rabi resonance formula and the, uh, Einstein's ideas of absorption and emission of radiation. Um, okay. The, the, the Rabi resonance is periodic, you know, the atom cycle between these two states, and under favorable conditions, they will. But that's not generally what one sees when one tries to excite atoms. If you'd like to excite atoms to an excited state and bring them back down to the ground state, you're likely to be uh, frustrated. One of the assumptions in the Rabi formula is that things are periodic in time. Or, or if you like, that time goes on. It's a consequence that it's periodic. Suppose times are limited. Suppose one has distribution of interaction times. For instance, if you're in a molecular beam going along through a region, the atoms at different speeds and interact for different times. A very nice example is the hydrogen maser in which atoms go into a bulb and they rattle around and come out kind of randomly. One can show in a case like that, and there are other cases too, that the probability of spending a time t, which we can call f of t, is given by gamma e to the minus gamma t. You know, where the average time you can easily show it would be just 1 over gamma. This, this is sort of an escape rate. Then if we look at the average probability of a transition then by the Rabi formula, which I'll call like that, it, it's just going to be given as e to the minus gamma t times, again, you know, this thing over here. Oops. squared of this thing okay and one can do this integral and it comes out to be equal to one half Omega Rabi squared over this denominator Omega Rabi squared plus Omega minus Omega naught squared plus gamma squared familiar formula, th this is called, this is called a Laurentian curve. If I look at the transition probability, P, 
as a function of, of frequency, well, it, it can look like this. And then as you increase the Rabi frequency, it eventually looks like here. <coughs> this is um, omega Rabi squared is, is going to be very small, say, compared to um, gamma squared. Low power. And the width of this thing over here width of the thing is essentially going to be equal to um, to gamma. Here we have omega Rabi squared large, much greater than say gamma squared. Okay. One thing we know if we make this if we make omega Rabi squared very large compared to everything else, this goes to one half. You can't, you can't move more than one half the atoms over. It's very disappointing. But the, the reason is, physically, uh, you know, these atoms are cycling up and down. And by the time you, you, you've cycled a lot of them up, you're also cycling them back down. And if you do this as strong as you can, you end up with half of them up and half of them down. So th the maximum that you can get is one half. Um, as you, go to, as you go to lower power over here, the line gets narrower. It reaches its natural line width over here. The full width over here is going to be just two gamma. Um, if you try to, um, if you de decrease the power, the thing just gets smaller and smaller. Okay. The line over here, this is a very wide line. This is called saturation. The line is saturated. Saturated means that it's, it's very broad. Uh, it's not very good for doing high precision spectroscopy. But this shows sort of one of the natural trade-offs in, in that one always gets in making measurements. If you'd like to make a measurement, you'd like to make it very precisely. So you want as narrow a line as possible. Uh, but it's not just a narrow line which comes into measurements. It's, not, it's a narrow line, but you also want a signal. Okay. You notice as you decrease the power over here, the line gets narrower and narrower. But then eventually, the signal just gets smaller and smaller. So you have some trade-off between uh, trying to uh, to get a signal and trying to make it as narrow as possible. Well, that's just <coughs> one of the typical trade-offs that one gets in, in making measurements. Now, <coughs> what I would like to do now, though, is to turn to the more uh, general question of excitation as one might often get with laser light, the kind of excitation that one uses for manipulating ultra-cold atoms and you know, trying to prepare ultra-cold atoms that you use for laser cooling um, or for trapping atoms and such. So what I want to do is to talk about the, um, the uh, just talk about hmm, classical quantum radiation theory. And I want to um, calculate the rate at which one can uh, excite atoms, say, with lasers, because this is something that one needs to be able to do if you're going to make the measurements. Or if you're just a theorist, it's nice to know what some of the experimental limitations are for doing this. Um, I would also like to uh, calculate the spontaneous emission rate, because that's a very fundamental, it's a very fundamental property of nature. It always comes in. Ultimately, it's the source of fluctuations and noise in nature. Uh, and although with experiments so far on ultra-cold atoms, that, hasn't, that, that is not an issue. But someday, there's probably going to be some convolution of this 
a field of atomic quantum fluids and cavity quantum electrodynamics, and then it really will be very much of an issue. Now, one of the problems I faced is when I saw this, I realized there's so much detail in it, it's just going to get very boring if I put in all the steps. Um, so I will put in the major steps, but the, um, the other steps, well, you can find them in many of the standard texts, but they'll certainly be in the notes over here. So what I want to do is start with uh, Maxwell's equation in free space, and uh, then introduce atoms, and then introduce the interactions between them. So, questions? Yeah, maybe this might be a good, I'm switching topics, so this might be a good place to ask about any of this. Okay. Maybe I should ask uh, how many of you are familiar with the quantum theory of radiation? No. Ah, well, in, in that case, have a cup of coffee. This will not be news, but I think it is important to know about it. Okay, the starting point is Maxwell's equations and we're going to talk about free space. And in free space, there is no charge or current, so the divergence of E, well, the divergence of B, these are always going to be equal to zero. And I'm going to introduce the vector potential in the Coulomb gauge. And that's arbitrary, but this is called the Coulomb gauge. Okay. It can be shown quite easily that A obeys the, wa the wave equation, namely that del squared A is going to equal 1 over C squared times this. Yeah. You can also, it's easy to show that A is transverse because our divergence goes to zero. So we can write A in general in a wave form. And it's A, it's some polarization vector, which is going to be transverse, times one half e to the i k dot r minus omega t um, uh, minus e to the minus i k dot r minus omega t. This is a yeah. And it's transverse so that e dot k is equal to zero. Yeah. The relation to the fields is is quite quite simple. E is equal to minus I omega A um, this is the polarization vector E times one half. <coughs> Let me call this whole thing times X times that wave propagator and B is equal to epsilon naught C over 2 omega squared. Uh, I'm sorry. B is equal to minus I K A times unit vector k cross e times one half x. 
the pointing vector is just epsilon naught c over 2 omega squared um, omega squared a squared and it's in the k direction so that gives a complete characteristic of the field now we'd like to see what happens <coughs> when you put an atom in the field The recipe is really very simple. The canonical momentum of the atom is just the kinetic momentum plus Q times A. That's the recipe. And then the Hamiltonian the atom in the field is 1 over 2m times j equals 1 with summing over all the electrons of the momentum piece of j plus e times a, which can depend on where you are, r sub j squared plus the potential of all these things j equals 1 to n. Yeah. And that simplifies too. First of all, when, when you take that square over there, we'll neglect a squared term. It can be justified that <coughs> it doesn't normally play much of a role. And um, we can write h as equal to h naught plus the interaction term, yeah. where h naught is 1 over 2m times the sum of p sub j squared plus, uh, plus the uh, v of r sub j. <coughs> and the interaction term over here, h interaction is simply equal to e over m times the sum of p sub j dot a. To just note here, because of the divergence, there, there is a commutator in here of uh, P with A gets involved there. But <coughs> that equals 0 in the Coulomb gauge. So that's just a side note of getting to this. Okay. So what we want to do is to look at the behavior of a system of a free atom, which is perturbed by this interaction. The interaction, which has all the physics in it, it isn't so obvious over here. It's just written in terms of the momentum and the vector potential. What it actually is, if we write it out, it's E times A over MC times epsilon dot P times the cosine of K dot R minus omega T. And if we look at matrix elements of this between two states, okay, these are the eigenstates without the interaction. We want to see what's going to happen to the system in the presence of this radiation field. It can be written as 1 half H B A times E to the minus I omega T plus 1 half h b a e to the plus i omega t. It's helpful to keep out the k 
keep these two terms separate over here because we'll see that one is going to uh, correspond to absorption of radiation and the other to emission. And this matrix element, H, B, A, then this E, E, A over M times this polarization vector dotted into B, P, multiplied by the field. Now, it's E to the plus I K dot R A. This term over here can be written as P times 1 plus I K dot R plus higher order terms. Yep. No, th those are states of the atom. Yeah. So I should have been clear about that. We're looking, we're going to look at what happens if an atom's in state A, for instance, under the presence of this field. Yeah. So they're atomic states. Now, this matrix element here, maybe I should just write it out. State B. P times 1 plus I K dot R plus higher order terms here, <coughs> state A. Let's look at physically what this means is, well, I'm looking at the momentum operator between states A and state B. So I'm going to take a dipole moment of this, <coughs> not a dipole moment, a matrix element of this operator here we have k dot r. Now, k is the wavelength of the light, or 1 over the wavelength of the light. It's the wave vector, right? So I can write k dot r. Its magnitude is going to be of this order of r over lambda. Now, if I take a matrix element involving r between these two states of the atom, it certainly can't be large compared to the atom maybe the size of the atom or small. Okay. We're talking about light over here, perhaps which is optical wavelengths, which is very, very large. So this term is smaller than that term by the ratio of the size of the atom to the wavelength of light. So, you know, in the spirit of physics, something small, you call it zero. So we're going to neglect that. now. There are times when you can't neglect that. If this matrix element here should happen to vanish, then the next one over here is this. What this will correspond to are the different orders of multipola multipolarity in radiation. We're going to be looking at what's called dipole radiation, which is the most important kind. But sometimes it doesn't occur. There may be selection rules which forbid it. In that case, you go to the next term. The next term, this is, will be electric, we'll see electric dipole radiation. If you include this term over here, we're going to uh, include magnetic dipole radiation due to magnetic interaction between the levels or electric quadrupole radiation. Both of those processes are very small compared to this process over here. So these higher order terms are generally called forbidden. but forbidden with very large quotation marks there because they're often useful. But at least for the moment right now, we can neglect them. So the next term then, or well the next step, is to 
put these together. We're going to call this the dipole approximation, which is simply to neglect the next terms. Approximation. Okay. Yeah. There are various ways to deal with the a squared term. You can make a, take a Coulomb gauge in which it doesn't appear. In general, it's negligible because it does not cause transitions. Where it is not negligible is if you're looking in magnetic fields. Th that cause that corresponds to a diamagnetic effect because th this same formalism will hold true in static fields. In diamagnetic effects, it can be very important. Um, for instance, in Rydberg atoms, that A squared term, uh, which depends, uh, it, it depends on the square of the radius. Uh, uh, no, it's, it's, it depends on R squared. Yeah, this is the square of the size of the atoms. If that becomes enormous, then the A squared term can play a role there. But in radiation processes, it's it generally does not. And I'd have to sit down and look more just how it does come in. But uh, I don't want <coughs> to get digressed on that right now. But yeah, it's, it's not obvious that you can neglect it. OK. Now, in the dipole approximation, this matrix element between these two levels is given by E times A over M times the polarization vector E dotted into B times P times A. And if we write this in terms of the field, which I prefer because I never measured a vector potential, but I've measured fields, minus I times E times the electric field divided by M omega times E times B times P times A. Yeah. Now. It makes an interesting problem, and I'll leave it at that. It is possible you can show that the matrix element of B, of, I'm sorry, of P between B and A is just given as I times M times omega times B A times B times R times L A. <coughs> you can turn it into a matrix element of the, the radius. If you think of a classical harmonic oscillator, which is oscillating back and forth, you notice that the momentum is just going to be equal to uh, m times the velocity, and the velocity is omega b a r. <coughs> so it's, it's a reasonable thing, and you can prove it quantum mechanically. And um, I won't prove it here. I'll leave it as a little problem. Now, we're going to call the dipole moment matrix element between b and a <coughs> is just um, given by minus E times B times R times A. This is the, it's an di electric dipole moment operator. We're simply saying that D is equal to minus E times R 
Okay. And in that case, H B A is simply equal to minus D B A. Oops, H dotted into you can write this as E naught times E to the minus I omega T. One might have just written this down to begin with. Um, the atom, if it has a dipole moment, the dipole interaction of a dipole moment with an electric field, you know, is minus just is minus the dipole moment times the field. It's an oscillating field. <coughs> so the answer that one comes out with all of this is quite reasonable, um, but it isn't quite trivial. One reason is that uh, if d vanishes, we now have a way to go to higher fields. Okay. Now. We cannot use this <coughs> formula. We, we can't continue in this direction, though, and come up with spontaneous emission. And the reason is uh, our field is classical here. If we would like to really understand the interactions of the atoms of the field, <coughs> we have to quantize the field, second quantization. Um, I won't go through all the details on that, but I will sort of sketch the outline and the details again are <coughs> given in the notes. But what we want to do now is have a, a quantum picture of the electromagnetic field and see how that, <coughs> how the atoms behave in that. Well, if we're going to quantize it, it's very useful to introduce some finite volume. So let's consider some volume V. The classical energy in that volume what I call U, this is the total energy in the volume, so it's not an energy density, is epsilon naught over 2 times omega squared times A squared times V. <coughs> now, what I want to do is to write the vector potential well, this, uh, first of all, th this is quadratic. It looks like the energy of a harmonic oscillator. So I'd like to make it look like the energy of a harmonic oscillator by introducing uh, th these <coughs> new variables. We can write A as equal to 1 over omega times the square root of 1 over epsilon naught V when we square it, that'll get rid of these things over here. And we just introduce these two new variables, q plus ip. This is by definition. And a complex conjugate is just going to equal the complex conjugate of, these of those variables. And then I'm going to use what I know about the quantized harmonic oscillator. I'm going to introduce the variable a, the operator a, which is 1 over the square root of 2 h bar omega <coughs> times omega q plus ip, <coughs> and a dagger, which is 1 over the square root of 2 h bar omega times omega q minus 
IP. No, I am introducing. Uh, no, I am now becoming quantum mechanical. Here is the instant in which I'm going to quantize it. I'm going to introduce the um, commutator A. A dagger is equal to one. Okay. And those follow just from the quantum mechanical commutation rules of, of position and momentum. So <coughs> this is the state where one quantizes the field. I could introduce these as, as classical quantities over here, but now <coughs> I'm interpreting them as quantum mechanical properties. So we get this commutation rule for A and A dagger. Okay. Now, these are the creation and annihilation operators. It's easy to show, for instance, that if we have a state um, n minus 1 and a and n, it is the square root of n and n plus 1 times a dagger times n goes to the square root of n plus 1. The energy of the field, u, which is 1 half omega squared q squared plus p squared, goes over here to h bar omega times n plus one half, where this is the number of photons in the field. Yeah. So the Hamiltonian of the field, well, the expectation value for that is h bar omega times uh, n plus one half. Now, we can we can write down the electric field in terms of operators now. So show that the electric field E is equal to minus I times the square root of h bar omega over 2 epsilon naught V times A polarization vector E times E to the I k dot R minus omega T minus a dagger e polarization vector complex e to the minus i k dot r minus omega t. If we take the dipole limit, namely we're going to neglect the higher order terms there, <coughs> we have that E is simply equal to minus I times the squ square root of h bar omega over 2 epsilon naught times V times, times <coughs> A E minus A dagger times E, like so. And the interaction Hamiltonian now in quantized form is equal to minus I E 
times the square root of h bar omega over 2 epsilon naught times v times r dotted into this thing a e e to the minus i omega t minus a dagger e to the plus i omega t. Huh. Okay. Sorry, that was like pulling teeth, but at least now we have that result. We can, uh, with this, there's a lot of phenomena that we can explain. Um, the simplest um, solution to this thing, one which was put up many, many years ago just as a formal exercise in quantum mechanics has become a very interesting, uh, opened a very interesting area of physics. Namely, suppose you just have one mode of the radiation field. Um, how does the system evolve in a single mode of the radiation field? Well, how would you get a single mode of the radiation field? Well, we are in a cavity right now, correct? Cavities have modes. <coughs> let's make it an ideal cavity and let's consider just, say, the, uh, the ground state mode of the cavity. That would be a single mode of the radiation field. Okay. So what I would like to do is to look at how the system evolves then between an initial state. That's an interesting proposition. L l let's talk about it later. Okay. Um, actually, I'm going to avoid the problem for the moment because we're going to be looking at a system in which there is no spontaneous emission. Okay. But now the explanation of spontaneous emission and its relation to the zero point to the fluctuations in the vacuum is certainly. Yeah. theory had better uh, explain why you don't see spontaneous absorption. Okay. All right, l let's look at an initial state. And I hope this doesn't cause confusion. I'm going to call it the state A. This is a state, not an operator. It's going to be state A in which there are n photons. Okay. This is, we're talking now about one atom. It's say in a cavity, it's in the state A and there are n photon present. That's an initial state. And the final state that I'm interested in over here is a state B in which there are n prime photons in the cavity. Okay. I can write the initial state over here then as simply A and n. And the final state over here is going to be the state of B and n prime. And I'd like to look at the transitions between these states due to that interaction. Okay. So what I'd like to do is to evaluate the matrix element between the final state, the interaction Hamiltonian over here, <coughs> and the initial state. And if you just plug in, it comes out to be minus I, E, we'll take, the di we'll take the polarization vector along the z-axis. So we have a matrix element, z, a, b, between the two states. And then we're going to have n prime times a, e to the minus i omega t minus a dagger, 
e to the plus i omega omega t. <coughs> and uh, this is omega a b. G. Vanderlei asked me to write these subscripts large. Minus i omega a b t. And then it is minus a dagger e to the plus i omega a b p n. And the whole thing is oscillating at e to the minus i omega a b t. Uh. Okay, with this, the selection rule over here says that n prime had better be equal to n minus 1. And this selection rule over here says that n prime had better be equal to n plus 1. So there we have it. Now, what makes this interesting is suppose we look at uh, the vacuum. Okay. Suppose we look at the system in which there is, um, uh, in, in which in the initial state over here, that, uh, that uh, n prime is 0. Okay. If n prime is 0, then n is equal to 1. So what we're looking at is a transition between, in the system between the um, system going from uh, the atom with one photon and the cavity empty to the other way around. If we do that with n equals 0, then what we have is that f times h interaction times i is simply going to be equal to its i e z a b times the square root of 2 pi h bar omega over epsilon naught v period. We call this 0 fi. Now, because of energy conservation, th these uh, initial and final states are degenerate. But what we have is an interaction between them which has split the degeneracy. Well, we know what happens if you have a degenerate system and you suddenly split the degeneracy. Um, you're going to start to oscillate back and forth between the systems, okay? depending on the, on the phase of these two states. So what <coughs> the eigenstate of the system are plus and ma plus. The system is, again, the empty cavity. It's an atom with one photon in it, which is degenerate with the atom in the ground state and the cavity having one photon in it. The eigenstates of the system are symmetric and anti-symmetric combination of those two states. Because of this coupling between them, if you start out in one of these eigenstates, it's going to oscillate into the other eigenstate. Well, <coughs> if you start out in one state, which is a superposition of the eigenstates, it's going to oscillate into the other state. Namely, if you start in the superposition of atom and cavity just correctly, things will stay fixed. But if you start out with, say, the atom excited and the cavity empty, a little while, the other eigenstate's going to be occupied. The cavity will have one photon and the atom will be in the ground state. This is called vacuum Rabi oscillation. And the, and, and the frequency with which they oscillate, omega r, this is vacuum Rabi frequency, it's called. It's 
easily shown, it corresponds to, in magnitude, the dipole moment times the electric field. I'll call this the electric field in the vacuum, where the energy, one half epsilon naught times E squared, um, is just going to be it times, th this is the energy density, times the volume of the cavity. So this is the total energy in the cavity, is just going to be equal to, uh, equal to h bar omega. And I think this is correct. There may be a numerical. I'm not sure of the numerical factor right there, but it's about one. It, it's a rather unusual result. If you look at, if you try to look at this thing classically, and I might say I was looking at this in the very early stages and trying to look at it classically, <coughs> um, and trying to describe the evolution of the system due to the zero point energy in the cavity. Okay. You go into the rotating system and look look at a magnetic field which is, or electric field, which is due to the zero point energy in the cavity, and think of the atom precessing around that. It's a very simple one mode, the Rabi picture should work. Well, if you start out, say, with the, uh, with the atom in the excited state and no photon in the cavity, you have one size field, okay? As the atom evolves down and the field in the cavity grows, it should oscillate faster the picture that you get is not of uniform oscillation. It's, it, you, you can make a picture. It turns out to be totally haywire. <coughs> and it turns out the reason that it's haywire is that uh, the field is quantized and you cannot use a simple rotating frame picture with a quantized field. Uh, that uh, the pictures that we used, which are very useful for looking at the evolution of a particle in, a, uh, in an oscillating field, in the rotating frame uh, system is perfectly fine as long as you're classical. If you're quantum mechanical, it breaks down completely. But what's really quite amazing is that the quantum mechanical behavior is so much simpler. You no longer think of the atom and you think of the field. What we have is a couple system. The atom in the cavity is one quantum system. And they're coupled together. And they have, uh, its normal modes are coupled together and it just evolves regularly between the normal modes. This was the thought which sort of started out the field, which is now called cavity quantum electrodynamics. And uh, it's, well, it, it's now a, uh, an important area in physics and really amazing things are being done with it. But at, at the root of it all is this atom field coupling, this Rabi oscillation. Uh, it sets a time scale for seeing these things. In the old days, you didn't have enough time to see them. The Rabi frequency, the, the rate w was uh, too slow to observe. Physically, in order to see these things, you'd have to have a cavity whose damping time is long compared to the Rabi rate. But people have made these cavities now, <coughs> and so that's kind of opened up a new area of physics. However, that's a digression. It isn't the physics that we directly need for studying quantum fluids. So I hope in, in my last lecture, I'm going to return to topics which are much more uh, directly germane to that. So <coughs> maybe this is a good point to stop.